Okay, I think it's recording. Uh, the floor is yours. Awesome. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah. If I click, they change. Yep. Yeah. All good. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks very much for um, giving me the opportunity to discuss some of my work. Um, thanks, John Luigi, for the invite. Um, my name is uh, Michael Albergo. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some uh, work in, in scaling up continuous time normalizing flows that myself and Eric van den Eyden and have been working on um, that we're calling a stochastic interpolant method. So the title of my talk is Stochastic Interpolants for Generative Modeling. If I have some time, I might be able to give some applications of this into some more scientific contexts that we're interested in for scientific computing for like quantum field theory type calculations. But um, I may just see barring barring content stick to stick to the, the method. Um, just for some context on me, um, my in research interests are, are primarily in computational approaches to um, the physical sciences. So in particular, I, I like to study questions in high energy physics and condensed matter from a computational perspective. And often that means now um, trying to build machine learning techniques that are sort of inspired by the underlying physics of what we're trying to study and sort of tailoring how we think about ML for the demands of scientific computing, which are a little different from, you know, maybe the task of computer vision scientists or, or uh, uh, more conventional AI types. So just as examples, you know, here's a uh, simulation of the QCD vacuum energy density that we would want to do on large scales and, and how you might um, need to build components for a you know, normalizing flow type thing to simulate this on weird structures like uh, on circles or on tori or uh, on, um, on different sort of group elements. And before I go any further, I just want to thank all my collaborators for for all the content that'll be in this. Primarily today, I'm just going to be talking about results with Eric, but my interest in flows has sort of been inspired and built on work with the, this group at MIT and DeepMind um, and some other ideas coming from some other projects. So uh, thanks to all them. My agenda for today is really to talk about density estimation and sampling um, through the perspective of transport maps. So I'm going to give a background on that picture that'll touch a little bit on some historical context, but really try to motivate why we care about this problem. And then I'm going to dive into the challenge of how do we learn, you know, the most expressive and scalable uh, maps to meet this meet this uh, objective. My pitch is going to be that um, this this method we've been working on that we're calling stochastic interpolant um, will be um, useful in fulfilling that. And I'm going to along the way contextualize what it is in the context of score based diffusions to sort of motivate why we think it's a good uh, good direction. Uh, in addition, there's actually a, a framework and sort of uh, perspective on it that relates to optimal transport that I think actually has pragmatic use rather than just being a realization of optimal transport. So I'll give a little info on that and then time permitting, as I said, I'll touch this um, MC, MCMC and lattice field theory application. OK, so the problem setup um, is, is pretty straightforward. Our goal is going to be to uh, estimate the unknown probability density function, which I'm calling here row star either through sample data which i have available to me or through query access to the unnormalized log likelihood um, particularly today i'm just going to really talk about the sample data picture and the motivation of that is from sort of the rapid success we've seen in computer vision applications of, of challenges just like this you know how do i learn to sample on a, under a distribution and perform some sort of density estimation uh, on high dimensional problems such as images. You know, since 2012, we've gone from generating MNIST to being able to query a large language model to tell me to draw two scientific bears doing a chemistry experiment, and I can get that image in a matter of seconds. Um, and moreover, um, the reason I want to paint this picture is that, as you can see, as we get more and more into the pr progress of this timeline, the measure transport perspective underlying these models really starts to appear. And it's clear that it's worthwhile to think about measure transport in motivating designing good generative models. So the framework for this transport picture is, is the following. Um, I'm going to say I have a very simple base density, like a Gaussian, that I call row B. And my goal is going to be to build a reversible map, T, such that the push forward of this base density row B by this map T gives me a target density row star. Okay. The goal is going to be to infer what T is. Um, and T is, of course, going to be acting on the level of samples, but this is just sort of the nomenclature we use to describe it. The important part of this is that I actually can have a, 
uh, representation of rho star via this change of variables formula given here on the bottom of the screen. That's basically saying because my map is invertible, I can actually um, compute uh, what the change of measure is explicitly on any sample X um, by evaluating rho B and then looking at the uh, determinant of the Jacobian of the transformation. OK. Obviously, you know, when this is a learning problem, um, we need to ask what is the optimal T that we can learn to, to, to meet some objective, right? And so we have some desiderata on our parametric realizations of T because we don't have it a priori and we need to learn it. And one, we need it to be invertible and we need this application to be computationally efficient if we want to use it for anything. Moreover, we need this determinant of its Jacobian to be a tractable yes. computation. Sorry, I didn't mean to close it, but I don't want it full open either. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we need this determinant to be tractable, which means we have to put some sort of constraints on T to be able to realize it, this change of variables in any efficient sense. So there's a trade off that we have to balance here. You know, we want this. Uh, transport to be as unconstrained as possible, so that can be expressive and learnable, but we also need to think of um, some sort of computational limitations. So how has this started? Well, sort of a brief history on this trade-off um, began with um, Chen and Gopinath in this Gaussianization paper in 2000, where uh, Esteban Tabak and Eric Van den Eyden then realized, okay, there might be sort of a way to realize what this transport is sort of sequentially in a series of maps that I'll call TK, breaking down the bigger transport. And then um, the neural network folks came along and said, ah, well, what if we sort of built into that um, some sort of um, expressive parametric structure um, that we can fulfill through some sort of neural network parameterization? And that's where works by Laurent Din and Danilo Resende and George Papa Macarios appeared um, that showed that, you know, if you put structure on the transformations in a clever way, um, you can actually um, parameterize these with uh, invertible neural networks in an effective, an effective manner. But it sort of motivates the question, OK, if I'm doing many of these structured transformations in a row, what happens if I take the sort of k equals infinity limit of this and say now actually t isn't just a series of transformations, but it's the solution of a continuous time flow, OK? And this is work by Will Grothwall and, and Ricky Chen in, in their Fjord paper in, in 2018. And you know, one of the benefits of thinking in this picture is that this intractable um, determinant of our Jacobian that we had to compute now actually can be rewritten in the sort of instantaneous time picture as the trace of the instantaneous change of some velocity field. Okay, so we have an instantaneous transformation that is now described by a, a, a drift or a velocity field that I'm calling VT, and we'll define a little bit better in the next slide. And the, the benefit of doing this is now this um, trace is actually estimable with the skilling Hutchinson estimator and, and something that only squ uh, scales uh, linearly with the dimension of the problem. And so that's a nice trade off we can we can work with. Moreover, since you know the advent of these neural ODE type, type tools where we can sort of um, you know, uh, back propagate through uh, ODE and uh, dynamical systems, there's, there's sort of a larger scale of possibilities for these models that emerges. And so because the rest of the talk is going to be working in this continuous time picture, I want to lay out very explicitly what I mean by transport uh, in, in this picture. It's a little different than just thinking about the full map T. Um, and I'm going to do that by introducing this thing I'm calling the flow map XT, okay? And that's labeled by some time uh, parameter T. XT is going to be given by a velocity field VT of X, okay, with the following conditions. Um, I have a, a, a sample, little x, that's maybe, for example, from my base density. At time t equals zero, xt at t equals zero is just going to be equal to that initial sample. So to given here in the in the in this pictorially in the uh, uh, bottom right of this graph. And then I'm just basically saying the time derivative of this flow map is just given explicitly by the velocity field evaluated at that point in the flow. So it's just basically saying, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, as we move down these flow lines, right, like the, the sort of velocity field is telling us how to move here. We just need to integrate this uh, over time to produce, you know, the map at time t. You can also ask what happens at the level of the distribution here, okay? And, you know, that's if I introduce some rho t, 
of x t. Okay, that's our density at time t anywhere, for example, along this um, you know cross sectional picture of of the uh, evolution of the probability density. And in fact, that's just going to be governed in this in this velocity field picture by some um, continuity equation or mass conservation equation, which is basically saying that the time derivative of the probability density is just given by some flux right through any part of this surface. And if we have the right boundary conditions and rho t actually solves this equation, then we're sort of guaranteed to end up at rho star at time t equals one. OK, and if we look at some venom Brenian theory, you know, we can we can guarantee that such a velocity field exists that meets these criteria. And the question becomes, how do we find a sufficient VT so that we actually can get from row base to row target okay, or row star? So one approach to doing this was the sort of uh, Will Grothball, Ricky Chen, Fjord paper um, where they just said, OK, let's do maximum likelihood estimation, just like we always would do for flows, right? Um, and what you know that amounts to is we have a continuous time version of that change of variables to have now here in the top right, OK, which is now instead of um, computing the determinant of the Jacobian, we have this you know trace of the instantaneous change of the velocity field integrated over time. And we can ask, OK, we know what the maximum likelihood problem looks like. It's just minimizing the KL divergence between the target density, which I know through samples, and my model density, row one, which just becomes, you know, minimizing the negative log likelihood of my model problem. OK, so under, you know, if we looked at the reverse dynamics, this minimization problem just amounts to uh, minimizing this following quantity, which is just the change of variables formula basically for row one. And, you know, if VT is just a neural network, then we can actually use the adjoint method from neural ODEs to be able to get the uh, gradient of this with respect to the parameters of the velocity field. OK, there's one hitch to this, though, because it sounds very nice, is that to evaluate your objective function, you actually have to integrate, um, solve your, your ODE, right? You have to solve this ordinary differential equation by actually pushing forward the velocity field using some, you know, Runge Kata or Euler integrator. And that means because you're now stuck with using this adjoint method, you actually have to solve the ODE on the fly every time you want to back propagate uh, to update the weights of the velocity field. OK, so you can either do this adjoint thing where you have to solve a, a number of equations simultaneously, or you could just back propagate directly through the unrolled computational graph um, because integrating this uh, velocity field over time means evaluating the neural network at many different times. But that, of course, becomes intractable quite quickly because if I have to unroll the computational graph of evaluating this velocity field a hundred times, then you know the the memory costs of this grow very poorly. There's a number of reasons why this cannot scale. The other part of this is maximum likelihood isn't really choosing a path in the space of measures between the base and the target. You know, I could learn a velocity field that takes me in all sorts of places so long as it actually ends up at the true target density. But you know, maybe that isn't so useful from a learning perspective because we know there are many paths that are quite simple that could probably connect these densities. So it motivates the question, you know, is there a simpler paradigm for learning this velocity than having to rely on the maximum likelihood approach? And we think there is, and we take some inspiration from the success of diffusion models to sort of parse this out. So I want to take a second to sort of, you know, lay a background on, on score-based diffusion. So, you know, this is a work by Yang Song and Yasha Soldikstein, uh, which relies on some techniques from Apo Hivarinen, namely the score matching technique. Um, you know, these are state of the art models for image generation for, for, for many tasks in, in generative modeling. Um, you know, I could query the sentence a brain riding a rocket ship headed toward the moon, and I can very quickly get an image that, uh, you know, encapsulates my, my interests. Um, by just, uh, you know, uh, using one of these Dolly or uh, type softwares. But the, the background of what uh, um, score based diffusion is really doing is it's saying I have a bunch of data, like um, uh, some from data from row star, my target density. And what I do is I devolve it according to an Ornstein Ollenbeck process, which is just, you know, some forward time SDE, which tells me how to add noise to my image at every time until it reaches a Gaussian. OK, so this is this is explicitly giving me a path via Gaussianization 
toward uh, connecting the base distribution, namely the Gaussian, to my target data. And then the learning problem that emerges says, OK, I know how to add noise to send it to a Gaussian. What do I need to go backward to be able to say, if I drew a new Gaussian sample, push this to be a sample from the target distribution? This actually just amounts to learning what is you know, known as the score of the uh, time dependent density the gradient of the log probability at time t. And if I learn this, then actually I can learn to go backward and be able to sample from my target density. So what does this amount to? Why is why are diffusions trainable? As I said, they've chosen a path in the space of measures. They can generate data at any time on that path by just following the ornstein ollenbeck process, which just says for any initial x, if I want a sample xt from rho t. I just have to compute it using this formula. And there's no need to simulate the dynamics, right, to get evaluate the loss function. They write down this very simple loss that says, because I can evaluate my density at any time t between the two endpoints, I can just do this regression on what the score actually is to be able to learn the backward dynamics. You know, they have to use this little trick of score matching by Havarinen to make this possible. But now, you know, it's just turned learning the velocity field, the drift, which in this case is driven by the score function, into a problem of regression. You know, I evaluate the, my estimate of the velocity at many points in time, and I just fit it, okay? So this is a much simpler paradigm for, for um, learning to connect these distributions. There are some inherent limitations to this, though. One is that the base density must be a Gaussian because they rely on this ornstein ollenbeck process to convolve it with noise towards some, some Gaussian distribution. And it's actually only exact if I did this for an infinite amount of time, right? It takes an infinite amount of time to actually reach that Gaussian. Um, so they have to take a very large T value that is not obviously infinity. Um, so it introduces a little bit of a bias in the method. Moreover, because this is an SEE, it does not directly give any access to you know, the likelihood under the change of variables picture, which is something we obviously care about in, in many aspects of statistics and computational science. So, you know, this motivated us to ask, OK, we know the paradigm works well for training. Is there a way to avoid the SDE entirely, work on a finite interval so that we actually satisfy the boundary conditions of some, you know, Fokker Planck or, you know, continuity type equation with arbitrary base and target density? So you don't need to just rely on a Gaussian build a connection between them that allows us to get this velocity directly with no notion of the score. And so our pitch is that this is feasible to do with this stochastic interpolant method. OK, the stochastic interpolant method is actually built on a very, very simple observation. Um, it's almost kind of trivial. I'm going to introduce this uh, function, which I call the stochastic interpolant, IT. Okay. That's a function of both data from the base distribution and data from the target distribution, such that I of t for any value of t evaluated on a sample from the base and evaluated as a sample on the target, okay, explicitly gives me a sample x of t, okay, from the intermediate density rho t. Okay. My only requirements is that this interpolant function I have a very simple set of boundary conditions. At time t equals zero, i of t of x b x star must just evaluate to x b. Okay, and at t equal one, it must evaluate to x star. So a trivially simple example of what this interpolant looks like is just the function one minus t times the sample from the base plus t times the sample from the target. Okay, so you know at t equals zero, it's pretty obvious that I just this just evaluates to the sample from the base, and at t equals one, this evaluates from the sample. Um, from the target density. And the sort of interesting thing about this, though, is that if I independently draw these samples from the base and target, taking expectations over that, over those two densities, actually defines the interpolant density at any point in time between these two. OK, so, you know, rho t equals zero is actually just going to evaluate to rho base and rho t equals one is just going to evaluate to rho star. OK. But any time in between, by just evaluating and taking expectation over this interpolant function, it's allowing me to take expectations over the intermediate density, much akin to what this ornstein ollenbeck process is doing 
to connect to the Gaussian, but now we're saying, OK, you can write down any interpolant that's going to connect these two densities. It doesn't have to be something that comes from this ornstein ollenbeck process. My claim is that if you do this, then rho t actually does satisfy this continuity equation that I introduced before, and we can reduce the problem to learning a velocity field. OK, why, why does it satisfy this continuity equation? Well, it's, it's sort of a, another trivial statement. I have this expression for the interpolant density, rho t, which is just a you know Dirac delta function that is evaluated at any point x is actually equal to the interpolant, taking an expectation over the two densities. And if I just take a time derivative of this, okay, I can see that I can actually uh, write dt rho t in terms of a current, okay, which is just based on the time derivative of the interpolant itself, okay. And with just the trivial redefinition of saying the velocity is just this current divided by the interpolant density for any case in which the interpolant density is positive, then I have an expression for what the ideal velocity field is. OK, so the continuity equation is obeyed, and all I need to do now is figure out this velocity field, which should intrinsically be related to this current. OK, so here's a very simple proposition. OK. The optimal velocity field, you know, the one that minimizes the following objective, right, um, is very actually sort of straightforward to find. I can basically say that the the, the PDF, the uh, rho t that satisfies that continuity equation that I just wrote on the previous page, has the velocity field, which is the unique minimizer of a very simple quadratic objective function. It's saying uniformly sample over time, independently sample over the base distribution independently sample over the target distribution and evaluate this least squares objective. OK, evaluate the velocity at the interpolant. And evaluate the time derivative of the interpolant and just take the difference squared, and this should give you the velocity field that connects the two densities. We usually work with this picture because there's a term that pops out that's independent of the parameters, so we don't really care about it. But this should look very familiar to the score matching diffusion picture because instead of working with the score now, I'm just trying to learn any velocity field that captures the time dependent dynamics connecting the two distributions. Okay. So we don't need I'm to work sorry, with the score. We, I'm Go sorry, ahead. are we supposed to be seeing an objective function because um, we're on slide 21 in the picture? I don't know if we're, mm. uh -oh. we're missing an, the next slide. I could actually see 23. Yeah, it's 23 for me too. Oh, mine is not updated. Sorry. I don't know. Let why. me see. Maybe if I go back and reload, it'll appear. Yeah, there's a problem on my end. Maybe I'll. I will leave and rejoin. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, no, no worries at all. Sounds good. OK, so yeah, on slide 23, we can just see, you know, there's a, a clear similarity here to be between what, you know, diffusions and score matching are trying to do and what we're doing. But now we don't need to work with you know, the score function here, and we can avoid the, avoid the score matching paradigm where they have to rely on computing a divergence, and we can just work directly with this velocity field. Okay. So why is this appealing? Okay, you know, now we've written something down that actually is just solving an ordinary differential equation. Okay. So now we can use all the fancy schmancy integrators for ODEs that you can't really use with an SDE. Um, it, the loss is pretty straightforwardly estimable, okay? And now we can connect any two densities. Okay, it doesn't have to be a Gaussian anymore. It could be, you know, if you have a scientific computing problem, you know, maybe a good approximation of what the the model is that you want to be testing versus, you know, a target one. You know, building in prior knowledge is possible. And sort of, uh, you know, nicely, we can actually write down a bound to show that our this min this loss function g actually controls the w two distance between our model row one and the target row start. Um, so, you know, we're not doing a maximum likelihood estimation paradigm anymore, but it still controls these, you know, uh, uh, probability measure, you know, metrics that we care about for convergence. OK, so, you know, here's some some toy examples. For example, you know, if I have this density, which is these you know, two moons, which are not known analytically, but are only known through samples, and I want to connect it to this very non Lipschitzy looking um, checkerboard pattern, OK, the top row here is what the interpolant would tell me the you know, velocity field should be doing at any time to push these samples toward this. And below is what the flow actually learned. OK, same thing over here for some checkerboard and you know, multi multimodal Gaussians. And then so just a visualization of what that uh, continuous time picture looks like. 
But of course, you know, um, our original interests were, were not for computer vision any tasks, but then when you submit a paper to iClear and you haven't benchmarked something on image data, they get upset with you and then you have to do the image experiments. Um, so yes, we show that it performs well on, you know, CIFAR 10 and ImageNet. And, you know, now we actually can scale these continuous time flows to, you know, pretty, pretty more arbitrary size, more arbitrary sizes. You know, this is a 128 by 128 simulation of these flowers, um, and this was able to be done on one GPU, for example. Um, right, and so, you know, numerically, you know, the density estimation comparisons to other flows is, is pretty good. Um, we had a harder time getting FID scores lower for our model um, compared to things like uh, score-based diffusion. The likelihoods are pretty much on par, uh, but I also had a very headache of a time um, getting a, a, a valid estimate of the FID. I think it's kind of a a shoddy metric in some ways, but those are some qualms with, you know, the, the state of the field more than anything else. But, you know, thankfully, um, there was some coincident work by Jan Lippmann and Ricky Chen and co that they call flow matching, which is introducing the same paradigm. Um, and they did a, a more robust, you know, comparison here to score-based diffusion to show they actually can get, you know, lower FID scores, better likelihood estimates on fewer function evaluations because we can work with this ODE picture um, nicely here. So I encourage you to check out their work as well. But there's a little more to the picture here because, um, you know, we chose an interpolant function kind of arbitrarily, right? Like I just said it was this linear interpolant one minus T times the base density plus T times the target sample, right? And if you relook at our objectives, this constant term that I, I left out before, you know, where I expanded the square of this expression and then I had this term that was dependent on V and this other one that was not, um, if V is actually the minimizer of this objective, so V hat equals V, um, it turns out that the lower bound, right, what, what this minimizer evaluates to is sort of very um, conveniently uh, reminiscent of the benamou brenier transport cost of, of uh, performing whatever transport you're doing. So it's lower bounded by um, the norm of the velocity field, you know, um, under the actual interpolant density, which you would have if V hat actually equals V. So it's asking us the question, okay, if this is a transport cost, is there a way for us to control the transport cost a la optimal transport in some way? And a priori, you know, we're not fulfilling optimal transport, okay? Because optimal transport should state that if I, I need to minimize over all transports, right, that minimize the following um, squared quantity, okay? such that my transport T hat actually pushes me between the two densities, okay? Which, but th what this is saying is that for us, it's not sufficient just to minimize over V hat. We also have to have this quantity minimized over uh, rho T star, the interpolant density, which for us is endowed by our choice of interpolant. I choose an interpolant function. That is going to choose what um, interp path in uh, the space of measures I take with respect to the interpolant density, rho t, okay? So a fixed interpolant fixes rho t. And that means we're not necessarily minimizing the cost. We need to ask, what do we need to change to minimize the optimal transport cost here um, uh, in the objective? And, you know, my claim will be that all we really need to do is choose a way to parameterize the interpolant to do this. And if we parameterize the interpolant, then I can write down the very simple proposition that on you know, some assumption of the class in, of densities, namely that there's this class of interpolable densities, then solving the following min-max problem, where I actually just, once I've minimized my objective over velocities, I now maximize it over parametric interpolants, then the optimal interpolant emerges for which rho t and vt are the minimizers of the benamo brenier optimal transport problem. Okay, the intuition for this is actually a little clearer in retrospect. I said that the velocity and the objective is, is uh, minimized by the following quantity, which is the transport cost itself, right? This is the Benamou Benamou transport cost. So it's minimized by the negative of it. All I want to do is make that quantity less and less negative, push it towards zero, um, i.e. I should be maximizing G with respect to the interpolant. So maximizing G with respect to the interpolant reduces the transport cost just pictured right here. Okay, so we can do this by just, you know, one one sort of simple realization of it is just to say my interpolant, which I wrote before is uh, one minus Tx0 plus Tx1 is now just 
a generic function a of t and a generic function b of t here that have the, the proper boundary conditions that you know make sure that this still has uh you know at time t equals zero evaluates to x zero and at time t equals one evaluates to x one so i could just choose you know some fourier expansion of of uh you know each of these expressions that allows me to have parameters alpha and beta which parameterize what uh, a of t and b of t are so you know in the non-optimal transporty picture okay we can connect this gaussian to this checkerboard but it's it's kind of taking non-straight paths okay and if and then i maximize over the interpolant you know maximizing over alpha and beta above i can have this nice smooth transport um, between the densities okay you know this actually allows us to get to slightly better likelihoods. Here's what the A of T and B of T look like after training. You know, they're doing a little something a little more wonky rather than just being these sine and cosine functions. Um, and a measure of the transport cost over here shows that we can, you know, greatly reduce it. But, um, you know, that's just a 2D example. We haven't done like a large scale test of this yet, but but it. I often find that people really love optimal transport in this in a lot of this literature, but it's sort of unclear a priori if there's any use to it in generative modeling. You know, um, you know, one would like to think that there is like you know the straightest or simplest path between densities is actually the one that we 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 want to learn, but it could be restricting the model in some ways that actually makes the problem like harder and in, in, in other ways. But here I would actually make the case that it pragmatically helps when we're dealing with these ODE integrators. Okay. Because integrating this ODE is actually much easier when the paths any individual sample has to take are straight. Um, in fact, you know, if you did this with some Euler integrator, it amounts to taking one step of Euler integration if every path is straight. And of course, if you want these to be efficient models in any sense, you don't want drawing a sample to take order seconds. You want it to take, you know, just a few uh, um, network evaluations, matrix vector uh, operations. So some other coincident work by Cheng Lu and company at UT Austin had uh, their own spin on how to do an optimal transporty type approach to this, which they call rectification. And I, I want to borrow their their um, their image here, which is basically saying, OK, for this FID score, which is a measure of how good my image samples are, um, how many um, steps of integration you know, of, an, of the ODE or the SD do I need to take to get a reasonable score? And you'll see, okay, um, in in pink here with the with the X is what the original you know score based diffusion required, and to get to an FID that is competitive with state of the art, they needed to evaluate this network a thousand times. And if you perform one step of this optimal transport picture, what they do, you can see that we actually can get this down pretty dramatically. And with three steps of it, you know they can in two samples get an FID of about five. Uh, in two steps, sorry, they get an FID of about five. So that's, you know, dropping the computational cost of this is pretty dramatically. And I think we should be thinking a little bit more about how to best make use of, you know, straightening the paths in the optimal transport sense here. OK, yeah, so just as a summary of what I was you know talking about here, we're trying to describe a general framework for training continuous time flows between arbitrary densities. OK, we take inspiration from the score based diffusion model because it um, um, the paradigm they set up there allows for, you know, a very straightforward optimization procedure. Um, but now, you know, we have some efficient training of, of continuous time flows and have a more controlled sampling paradigm than, than the diffusions might because SDE integrators are just harder to work with. Um, and we've also sort of removed the um, uh, uh, infinite time picture of things here that score based diffusion relies on. So we can actually in finite time connect these two densities. So now we actually have a you know a scalable paradigm for working with these continuous time flows. I do think there's some open questions here though that you know I'd be curious to discuss with you all if you'd like, or um, you know motivate some some things if 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 you find this interesting. Um, it's not really clear if there's a, an intrinsic benefit yet to working with an ordinary differential equation, i.e. deterministic transport between densities, or a stochastic differential equation, i.e. one that has some sort of stochastic part to the transport. You know, is there an intrinsic difference in learnability? Um, how do we actually benchmark the trade-offs between how fast we can, you know, sample from each of these types of models? And moreover, I, you know, would like to ask if there's like a variational formulation of this interpolant picture. Say I don't actually have samples from my target density, but I have um, access to the unnormalized log likelihood, which is much more common 
in, for example, like chemistry applications, you know, molecular dynamic type things, statistical physics applications of sampling under, you know, Ising model type problems, things like this. And lastly, you know, if you want to use these for any, this is me being more of a, you know, physicist, scientific computing type person. Uh, this trace estimation that I was talking about with the Hutchinson estimator, um, you know, gives you an unbiased estimate of the log likelihood that you would need from this change of variables, but it's a biased estimator of the likelihood when you exponentiate. So this is something that I think people should think a little carefully about because it's introducing a bias if you care about getting really clean estimates of those numbers. But just to motivate, um, you know, where we're, what we're thinking of doing in general with this stochastic interpolant picture is, you know, we, we see that there's actually a generic way to write down um, interpolants for an, like a much broader class of ODEs and SDEs that actually allow us to write down the likelihood of the SDE itself. Um, so, you know, we'll probably post this on the archive next week, but just as a teaser, we can now actually have like a stochastic process, learned stochastic process that connects arbitrary densities instead of just having to rely on this ornstein ollenbeck picture. Um, but of course, I'm happy to discuss that too if, if it's um, of interest. So thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, of course. And, um, I guess we have, uh, have some minutes for questions. And uh, does anyone does anyone want to ask something? Yeah, I have a question. Um, sure. Thanks for the talk, Michael. That was super interesting. Um, so I had technical issues at some point, so I lost a little bit of the talk. But um, okay. So I don't know if this was mentioned or not, but um, it's like the thing that you presented. It mm -hmm. um, seems like a very similar in spirit to um, the flow matching framework, but of course you've done more like transport stuff and maybe a bit of a deeper analysis um than the flow matching work um you have a comment on how these relate are they both kind of both similar frameworks of like a higher level abstraction or you know something like that yeah totally so um i hopefully i made mention of it enough uh here the, if the paradigms if you take the linear interpolant are exactly the same so um the flow matching picture oh, okay. um just chooses that, um, you know, the, 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 they did a great job of actually benchmarking this on, on some of the image data, but the, the paradigm they wrote down is for um, a Gaussian still, um, but with the linear interpolant and then a variation of the linear interpolant, which starts to approach the optimal transport picture. Um, so the works are, yeah, we've talked a bunch with them. The works are, are very similar and, you know, are sort of slightly different perspectives on the same topic. Ours is a little bit more from a computational fluid dynamics formulation of the of the transport with these continuity equations. Um, um, yeah, but it, it meets pretty much the same criteria. Uh, the only caveat I would say that is different is they add a small bit of like Gaussian noise to their process connecting the densities, which means at the endpoint they're not exactly um, arriving at the target density, even if they've solved their minimizer, but there actually could be benefits to doing this in the case of working with like the sort of discrete data of images, because um, you know you don't want the velocity field to, have to be singular right at the end, right, where it has to go to a discrete value. If there's a continuous value, it really wouldn't uh, matter. But I can see how that could be useful. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. This is part of the talk that I that well, I was having technical issues. So, um, ah, right. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry um, about that. Oh no, it's it's not your fault. I think it was my connection. Right. I have another question. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong. And in the mm -hmm. so just. Focus, if we focus on the connection, is pretty much if you go to the objective function, it's pretty much the same as the score based approach, right? And my question is, I guess that the main point of this is to basically get rid of the forward SDE. So we don't have any information about how, for example, in case of the score based uh, approach that you know exactly how every XT is perturbed at any time step T. 
Uh, but I was thinking in terms of the way you define the interpolator. So you start mm -hmm. from the from the X base. So, so basically you have um, an own structure prior, so you don't have any information about the data. And I was thinking, is it possible just looking at the way that you train a score base because you train that in having the information of the XT, right? And can you just basically have like some 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 sort of an interpolator that evolves with time, so you have information, so it's conditioned on the on the data, because that's that's basically the way that uh, you get pretty good results with score-based approaches or uh, diffusion models, right? So you have you train with this conditional information. So is how can you see that if is that possible uh, at all, or the main point of this is just to not have any information from the forward process? Uh, so one thing I would say is that um, score-based diffusion actually winds up being a subset of this paradigm. In fact, if I choose the interpolant to be a trigonometric interpolant, okay, where I say one minus t is actually cos of pi over two t, and this t over here is sine of pi over two t. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and the base density is a Gaussian, then this actually allows us to directly write down the score. Um, so in, in some sense, maybe it's not super clear from here, but when I define the, uh, let me go to the next slide. When I define the uh, current this way, okay, this is this Dirac delta function is actually fulfilling the, the conditioning that I think you're talking about. So another way of writing this is saying um, the current or you know, in other words, the velocity field, if I just divide by the probability density, um, mm. is going to be given by the time derivative of the interpolant under conditional expectation that um, x equals it. Okay, that's what this is basically doing. So another way of writing this would be expectation over under rho b rho star dt it conditioned on x equals x uh, it. And that is basically instilling that same sort of conditioning. The only purpose of this interpolant is it's just a more generic class of writing expectations under the time dependent density rho t. Okay, so it's just generalizing. It's really just sort of strictly generalizing the class of um, uh, ways that we can write down sampling rho t. It's not sufficient to actually do the push forward because if I have a new sample from the base density, it's not, you know, it's only telling me in expectation what the velocity should be at every point. I still have to learn a, a model of that velocity, but it is effectively doing this conditional, uh, you know, uh, uh, velocity as, as you're saying. And I, I think if you look at uh, Ricky and Jaren Lippmann's paper, the flow matching one, they, they spell this out a little more explicitly. In this work that we'll hopefully have online next week, we're going to try to lay out the comparison of all the, the formulas because it can be a little bit um, lost in there. I think the Dirac Delta formulation of it is a bit more of the physicist inspiration because we're not afraid of the Dirac Deltas, but <laughs> I understand that sometimes mm. they uh, scare mathematicians. Mm. Uh, then if, if this is a generalized way to uh, sort of the score-based approach. Um, why do, do you think that still this is not uh, beating the performance of the score-based approaches uh, or diffusion models? Well, I would actually say they are beating the performance down here if you look at Ricky and Yarn's results, but um, they had many more GPUs than me. <laughs> but <laughs> so but it's there, not get... because uh, as far as I know, for example, the DDPM on C410 is around 3.2 uh, FID scores or lower. Or C410. So maybe this. Uh... Right. So what they did here, I think what they yeah. had to do is basically retrain all these models from scratch on a fair playing field because mm -hmm. um, we had, uh, we both actually wound up, what we think is the same reviewer for iClear who suggested um, that we were using the wrong version of a downsampled ImageNet database and that the real one that we needed was from a torrent site. And so we sort of just, it, it was a mess. We sort of just, um, you know, tried to diplomatically work our way around it. But what they did it said instead was, OK, we're just going to retrain all the models um, under the same, you know, level of complexity, you know, model size, blah, 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 training time and benchmark them. And I think the takeaway from the, their results here are that you can get 
you know, a lower FID on the same model compared to the score methods under much fewer function evaluations of the network because you can do this ODE integration and this sort of scales uniformly across any data set that you take. Obviously, there's always room for when you're doing your own experiments for one's results to look better than the others, but they're pretty rigorous about this stuff and I trust their results. Um, you know, I've had time now to train some of my own versions of these on a larger scale that aren't in the paper and it seems to work pretty straightforwardly. Um, I mean, in some sense makes sense, like. It goes back to the question, though, of like, is there anything intrinsic about the SDE versus the ODE that makes the learning problem easier or makes the sampling, you know, more robust to errors um, in the learned velocity field? Um, and it's not a priori clear, and I think that's sort of an interesting question to ask. Um, I, I think the pick, the jury is definitely still out on, you know, theoretically, if there's a trade off between these two. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. Pretty, it's pretty interesting work. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Uh, we have uh, some more time for more questions. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah. uh, thanks a lot for the, the talk, Michael. This was uh, super mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, so I, I actually have a, a, a what I feel is likely a bit of a silly question that arises from what I now believe is a misunderstanding I had when I read uh, flow matching paper. But, okay. Uh, from reading that, uh, I kind of got that the linear interpolant was essentially OT optimal in that uh, you know it, it doesn't just map the the um, the base to the target, uh, but it does so as a as an optimal transport map. Um, th that understanding is clearly inconsistent with the fact that you're saying, oh, we can, uh, uh, you know, we we can get this minimax problem and actually get the, the optimal interpolant. Uh, so could, could you just uh, explain a bit on, on, on that? Yeah, totally. So I think there's two things going on. One is in, and I don't think it's a trivial question. I think it's a good question. Um, one is um, in the case of Gaussians, oftentimes, the best interpolant you can write down is a linear interpolant. But if you're not working with Gaussians, it's not true. The form of the linear interpolant they use is actually a little bit more what Chang Liu and company are doing. It's a little different where um, if I go to my linear interpolant, imagine instead of having one minus T X base plus T X star, X star was actually not a sample from the density, but actually the push forward by the transport T of X base. So assume you've learned um, uh, the perfect map, right? So you can take a sample X base and push it all the way to the target density rho star, okay? Then I could theoretically replace X star here with just the push forward uh, the, via the transport T of X base. In this case, this is a strictly straighter path in the space uh, in terms of the optimal transport cost, OK? But it requires that you've already solved the problem and you've learned a map T that gets you all the way there. If you have not all the way solved the problem, then of course this is still a push forward, but it's no longer an interpolant that actually exactly connects the base distribution to the target density. Because what's happened is um, if T is insufficient, then it is pushing forward to somewhere, but it's pushing forward to uh, row hat star instead of the true density row star. And I think what they're doing is more akin to that because um, part of what their linear interpolant includes is actually a push forward of the map itself. Um, so maybe that gives a little bit of, of more clarity into what's going on. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Thanks. And cool. uh, just a follow up question. Um, mm -hmm. um, have you had a chance to train um, one uh, essentially, you know, in, in the setup of the uh, Lipman and, and Chen paper, um, mm -hmm. uh, but further optimizing the uh, the interpolant. Like, uh, is there any empirical gain in like, for, for say, images, or do do you know if there's any empirical gain? Uh, I know you showed the the image, uh, trying to you know show that uh, if you use optimal transport interpolants, then you the FID gets better faster. Uh, right, but is there also some other benefit of, you know, do you end up learning the um, the transport map better? So, so if you do sample like quite a bit, do you get like, you know, even a marginal but but some improvement? 
I think that's sort of an open question. I think it's one of those things where you're putting more constraints on the learning, and that could be a blessing or a curse, right? I, I think a priori, I want to be like, yeah, optimal transport, it's, it's going to solve everything. But I don't think that's actually the case. And maybe a good example is imagine um, you have like a very constrained set of densities. There's like, a, imagine you have a density over here, and then there's like a hard wall or domain shift on the boundary of where the support is defined to say you have a density like over here then. So the velocity field must actually connect things by going around this density. If you did the optimal transport thing here, then there would be a very non lipids part of the velocity field. And that would actually be really bad to learn with a neural network. But, you know, so there's a question of like, what you really want is regularity probably in learning these in terms of the learnability. Maybe I can also motivate that by the statement I made about this W2 bound between the model and the target. Inherent in this bound is actually the Lipschitz constant of the, of the network itself. And so if you need to learn a function that is very non-Lipschitz, then it's actually harder to write down this bound in a strict sense. Um, I also think that's probably a product of the techniques we have for analyzing ordinary differential equations versus stochastic ones. But there is something to be said there about, you know, maybe the real goal that we want is like just very Lipschitz friendly velocity fields. And if that comes through optimal transport, that's very nice. But if it doesn't, that's also OK. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks again. Cool, yeah, thanks for your question. OK, we have a few more minutes. Do, do you have to quit at uh, uh, C-sharp or? Or do you have some more time? I, by, by like 12 or my in, in your time, like 6, 10, I probably should go. OK, uh, are there any more questions then from from people in the audience? Otherwise, I can ask uh, a small one myself. Oh. But uh, well, I have, if I you have, have a question, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, I have another one. Thanks. Um, so generally, um, we know that things, uh, these maps are diffeomorphisms. Um, what is your opinion on um, modeling real image data with diffeomorphisms uh, when probably has complicated topological structure not matching like your base distributions? And how does it work so well? I mean, that's I, all I can say is that it does work. I think the larger question is really just more about the neural network theory that I think is still an, an open question about why this seems to work so well, right? Um, I will I will also say maybe a counterpoint to that, that being on the sort of scientific computing side of this, what you want from a generative model actually varies a lot based on what your task. In the image generation task, one can sort of tout, su tout success by saying, look at this single image that I generated. It looks really real and realistic and is like in line with what my you know, request was in prompt. But then if you're trying to use these for any scientific computing purpose, and what you actually need to do is compute expectations underneath the model, right? Like you know, Monte Carlo estimates or something, or using the likelihood to importance sample or something, now your requirements look very different, and one very good sample doesn't mean much. And in fact, if you're missing part of the density in some, uh, some, you know, like a, a tail region, then the variance on all your important sample, uh, important weighting estimates can be huge. And in fact, the model isn't very good at all. So I think often, depending on who you ask, you know, the success of these is still an open question. For for things that have a lot of room for human error, like. Um, you know, image generation where if it looks real enough, we infer sort of in the creativity of it, then that might be sufficient. But in other tasks, I still think it's it's it remains to be seen that these are, you know, um, successful in that sense. I see. Thanks. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, uh, I have a question, but. I'm not sure how useful it is for the other people here, but I'm I'm just really curious um, where you are excited to apply this technique within you know scientific computing and physics. Uh, as I have a background in physics, and I just think it's super interesting to see where these types of techniques can be useful, other than making pretty images or interesting musical pieces. Yeah, totally. Um, I actually maybe have some slides here that can motivate that. Um, dum -dum. Uh, this is in applications to simulations in quantum field theory. I'll try to keep it brief because I think it may 
distract a bunch of other people, or it might just be nonsense to all of you, and I'm sorry if, if that's the case. But, you know, one of the things we want to do in quantum field theory primarily is just like compute fundamental quantities about the nature of reality. <laughs> and so um, often, you know, uh, the way we need to do that is actually through giant um, computer simulations of numerical integration, basically. We just want to numerically integrate like really, really high dimensional integrals. <laughs> um, so, you know, what that looks like for us is computing quantities like the following. Okay. If I have a, a variable phi, I need to be able to compute in expectation this quantity O. This could be like the mass of the pion or something. Um, and I want to be able to do it, you know, according to what the, the theory, the quantum field theory says, i.e. according to the action of the, of the, the theory, right? So often, you know, we have techniques from like Feynman diagrams and stuff to try to do this, but there are totally regions of, you know, the frontier where we can't, um, uh, you know, use those methods. And we actually have to just take these integrals and numerically integrate them on a computer using Monte Carlo. So that's like in low energy QCD, like inside the proton or in, you know, uh, correlated uh, quantum matter where we get all these crazy spin liquids and stuff like this. And there, the whole problem becomes put the quantum field theory on a big, big lattice, you know, discretize it in space time, and then try to sample the probability distribution of the field configurations, configurations of the lattices. So it looks like a big image problem, right? It just so happens that, you know, what we want this field dimension to be, instead of, you know, 128 by 128, we want it to be like 128 by 128 by 128 by 128. So it could be like, you know, 10 to the nine degrees of freedom compared to the other challenge. So we need the like very high Monte Carlo dimension. samples you need. Oh my God. Yeah. And then, well, it turns out the state of the art at those scales is to run like Markov chains that are like a thousand steps just because it's so hard and, and uh, the scales are so big. Um, so yeah, as you say, you know, we're just trying to generate these field configurations to estimate these observables. But this technique is really getting to the point where, you know, we're finally getting, you know, like percent level error on like the ab initio mass of the proton, you know, stuff like this. Quantities that can become important for, you know, like cosmology problems, you know, why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe, stuff like this. And our goal, hopefully, is to be able to use flows to replace the sampling in some sense, instead of relying on Monte Carlo type methods. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that more offline or send you some of these slides about how we are trying to fulfill some of that stuff. Uh, yeah, please send me some slides because I think it's super interesting. And I was mainly wondering about the training procedure. It, it makes sense to uh, generate these more pixelized versions of the quantum fields uh, to mm -hmm. do your sampling. So do you still do you take the the training set to to be just, you know, the things that we actually generated through numerical integration? Or do you do it through like extra constraints on the flow problem so it arrives at reasonable densities? It's kind of both. So actually, we we train with no data. Instead, what we do is we uh, sample from the flow, and then you can compute the backward, you know, the reverse KL divergence. So you're taking expectation just under the model itself. I think I described that right here. So now we don't have samples from the target. We only have access to the unnormalized log likelihood. It's the other side of the coin of the sort of problem setup I was talking about. But then you need to put, okay, these field theories have lots of crazy symmetries in them, okay? Like the action, the likelihood is invariant to very strange things, like, you know, um, like a, a, a gauge transformations of the, of the lattice. And so, you know, there's certain, certain things that we need to build into the flow itself. So for example, like, um, well, this is this is a which is examples of building flows on compact manifolds and stuff like this. Um, but yeah, any transformation of these like fundamental quantities of the lattice are actually leave leave the probability invariant. And so you need your flow to be equivariant, you know, have those transformations commute through it. And so um, yeah, a, a big part of this work is figuring out what structure to impose on the transformation to make this work. Um, and you know we have some sort of pictorial representations of this. I can tell you about uh, offline if you're curious about how to fulfill those sort of constraints. But it's a combination of a bunch of those things um, that that make this sort sort of possible. If you don't enforce these equip like these symmetries, then the thing doesn't train at all. It's actually uh, totally useless. 
I mean, dimensionality is so high and it can go any way you really want to enforce these types of equivariances throughout to, to right. just make sure you're, you know, within at least within margin of error of like physical possibility. That makes, yeah, makes exactly. sense. I like, I like it. I would definitely like to, to read a bit more about this. So please, uh, you can send John Luigi some stuff or me directly. I don't know if you uh, have access afterwards to the people from the meeting, but I'm, I'm super interested. Yeah, sure. I can pass him some stuff because I have his email and um, hopefully, yeah, he can pass it around. Maybe can I ask you the last question before? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just this uh, typical problem of sampling, right? So you have the, the partition function is the problem here, as you said. Yeah, Do you exactly. think that it's possible just replace this sampler, for example, the, the, the main motivation from the score based approach is just to get rid of the partition function? Can you just maybe just uh, plug in this sampler instead of going to uh, MCMC samplers? The uh, problem is um, you can definitely try, but it's still it'll be a bias sampler then. Of course, you can say, can I control the bias in a meaningful way? But the, this community, the quantum chromodynamics QCD strong force community, have very, very strict constraints about what they look for in a sampler. Um, and they really want everything to be asymptotically unbiased because they're trying to measure like precise quantities, like, you know, the muon magnetic moment, G minus two thing down to like, you know, the eighth, tenth decimal place or something. And so if they're not convinced that what they're doing has controlled uncertainty estimates, then they get very skittish of the idea. Yeah, it's a big no-no. Um, at the same time, as someone who sort of sits on the periphery of that community and isn't directly part of it, I do think, um, you know, they need to acknowledge that a, a Markov chain that has a thousand steps in it um, on a 10 to the nine dimensional problem probably doesn't have very great controlled uncertainty either. I mean, the Markov chain is yeah. only exact in the infinite limit, right? So, <laughs> um, I mean, because yeah, I think there's sort of a cultural thing going on there. Yeah, because in that sense, the division model is just itself a, a mark of change, right? And then, uh... yeah, they don't uh, metropolize the diffusion model, right? So there's no except yeah, reject true. that yeah, unbiases it. Not um, and I, that's a whole other battle to have with the QCD people um, that you don't necessarily hmm. need to metropolize, you know, MCMC processes so long as you are acknowledging the the error in some other way, either through like you know, random sampling on the chain after it's you know, been devised already, stuff like that. But I agree. I think there's there's many things that we could, could be thought about in this domain. Um, but it's it also involves some diplomacy uh, to convince yeah. them. <laughs> so then, do you do you think that feature work should be based on uh, trying to prove on biasness uh, or of these um, diffusion based samplers, maybe or uh, flow based samplers? Yeah, I think. If yeah, so so one thing we do, we, the way we set this up is that the flow is actually metropolizable. Um, mm. You can do this metropolis correction on it, but naively it's kind of hard to uh, to get a high acceptance rate and very high dimensions when if you do that. Um, so I think that's sort of an open question: is how do you actually um, you know make use of the flow in the smartest ways you can in terms of getting unbiased samples? We have formulas to make them unbiased, but are they you know, maybe in their sort of first order naive stage, or is there like, um, you know, more to more to be said on that front? Yeah, pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for all your uh, fantastic answers and a very good presentation. Then I guess we can uh, follow up via email and uh, um, yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, Thanks. sounds good. I do have one more minute if there was something that you, I know you had a question, John Luigi, that you didn't get to ask. So. Uh, I don't know uh, if, yeah, I can try maybe. The only the only curiosity that I had was uh, regarding the actual method that you introduced and you sampled mm -hmm. from the data distribution and from the base distribution, and then you train the velocity field. What right. I wonder is the resulting algorithm, the, the resulting training algorithm, does it have a one-to-one -one mapping between data and base distribution? Yeah, so this is the funny thing about it, right? So is we're doing this random pairing on the interpolant bottom bump right here, right? This is these are drawn independently. But when taken in expectation, the interpolant is not the velocity field itself, right? It's only allowing us to compute expectations under rho t to learn the push forward, right? To learn the velocity field. But the at the level of the velocity, we know that 
you know, the continuity equation states here that the velocity line, the field cannot cross, right? The flow lines cannot cross. So it turns out that even when you do this, this is still a valid paradigm for having a velocity field which is diffeomorphic. So there's there's uh, no double assignment here. Everything is a one to one mapping in the end. Even if we're doing this random pairing here, in expectation, it all smooths out to be a, a one to one pairing. Thanks. Very interesting. Yep. Yeah, thanks for your interest. All right, then uh, thanks again. And uh, yeah, I guess good luck with your follow ups and with your new preprint. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks. Bye bye. So long.